So this is our target superheat chart. And some very important things, let's talk about the basics of this chart, but I designed this particular chart off of the formula. Instead of learning a formula and memorizing the formula, I built the chart out and I had this on the back of my clipboard so that I could quickly reference all the information that I needed. Now, if you use the formula, that's fantastic. And if you're a chart person, that's fantastic. But really, both of these are out of date because we're going to talk later about some equipment used with an app that will do this for you. So very important steps here. First, I want to talk about the numbers. The rows going up and down, straight up and down. This is return air wet bulb. And return air is the air returning to the unit. Both of this equipment has return air. Air is returning to the unit. This one has air returning to the unit. These are upflow, so the air is pulling in from the bottom. Some units are downflow. Pretty much an easy way to think of return air is where your filter is going to be. Your filter is almost always in the return air. So that return air temperature is where you're going to get your wet bulb. So return air wet bulb, that's what we're looking for. And that return air wet bulb number is going down. So we're going to find that temperature here, and then we drop the chart down. So return air wet bulb, we can use our digital temperature, we can use our thermometer to wet wick, we can use the old school back rack, we can use a more digital style, but all of these are return air wet bulb. Across the top, it has the air entering return air wet bulb. The other number we're going to need is outdoor dry bulb. Dry bulb is just plain temperature. Here's a thermometer, the dry bulb, digital thermometer. This represents the temperature coming into the outdoor unit. So for outdoor temperature, I have my thermometer here in the shade, not in the direct sunlight. Don't stick this up inside the unit either because that's going to give you saturation. The temperature of the air coming into the unit. People say, well, how can I find the air coming in? Throw a piece of paper to it. If the paper sticks, that's air coming in. So read the air coming into the unit, dry bulb temperature, regular temperature of the air entering this unit. That's our second number we need. So on the side, it talks about temperature of the air entering the condenser, ODT for outdoor temperature. These are going to be running horizontally along the sides. So we find our outdoor temperature, and that's running across this way. We find a return air temperature, and this is running down. Where these two numbers cross, that's what our superheat should be for that day under those conditions. So we talked about the chart. This is a chart for a fixed orifice metering device only, or a capillary tube, but not for a TXV. The formula is IDWB for indoor wet bulb. You write that number down, times three. Then you minus the outdoor temperature. Then you minus 80, then you divide all that by two, and that gives you your target superheat for a fixed orifice only. So we're gonna use the chart, and we're gonna go through this example. So right now, let's just do, throw some basic numbers out there. So if you want the formula for it, it is IDWB, which stands for indoor wet bulb times three. Then you subtract that number by the ODT for outdoor temperature. Then you minus that by 80. Then you divide all of that by two, and that gives you your target superheat. For the chart people, bear with me, we're gonna do the chart. Now they're using the formula or the chart, the lowest number on here is five. You should never operate the system in a condition where the superheat should be less than five. If your superheat's less than five, you're gonna be flooding your compressor with liquid refrigerant. We do not want that to happen. So let's start out with some examples. We're gonna use just the room temperature right now. So right now, our temperature dry bulb is 71.8. We're gonna round that to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So in my chart, I find 72, which is right here, 72 degrees. So now we can see 72 degrees all the way across. That's our outdoor dry bulb temperature. Now I'm gonna set my thermometer for wet bulb temperature. So now it says WB, this is my wet bulb temperature. It is 60, we're gonna round that to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. This would be the return air, the air entering the evaporator coil, 67 degrees. So we see over here is 67 degrees, 67 degrees down. Outdoor temperature 72, return air wet bulb is 67. That means our target superheat right here is 24.5. That's what I want my superheat to be. That's the target under these conditions, 24.5. Now, as these conditions change, then our target superheat's also going to change. Let's say that our outdoor temperature stays the same and we turn the AC on and we cool the house down. 
and our wet bulb temperature drops to say 54 degree wet bulb. Remember wet bulbs taken in temperature and humidity. So we're going to move our paper over here. 54 degree wet bulb with a 72 degree outdoor temperature. Our superheat operating correctly would then be at 5 degrees of superheat. Let's say the indoor temperature was warmer. On a warmer day, let's say we heated the return air wet bulb up to 75 degree return air wet bulb. The outdoor temperature was still 72. Our superheat still working correctly would be at, at 36.5. So see how the superheat changes dramatically? And that's just with one outdoor temperature. So th that fixed orifice meter device may be simple, but it's more difficult for us to charge. Now let's go back to a different number. Let's pick, say, a 65 degree wet bulb. Here we turn our wet bulb, 65 degrees. That takes into account temperature and humidity inside. At a 72 degree day, At a 72 degree day, we're at 21.5 degrees superheat, if everything's working correctly. Now let's see what happens when the outdoor temperature goes up. So if the outdoor temperature rises, the indoor temperature and humidity stayed the same, and let's say we rose to a 96 degree outdoor temperature. So 96 degree outdoor temperature, our superheat would be at 9.5 and still be working correctly. Let's say our outdoor temperature went up even more. Let's say our outdoor temperature went up to be 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That means our superheat would be at 5. So if we ended up with 105 degree outdoor temperature and an indoor temperature of 65 wet bulb, remember that's humidity and temperature, our superheat would be at 5 degrees and still be working correctly. Now if we ended up heating the outdoor air even more, Let's say we were in Las Vegas and that outdoor temperature air rose to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. 110 degrees Fahrenheit, very possible. Now notice five is our lowest. Over here, we're in the gray area. That gray area says design, outside design temperatures never operate the system below five degrees of superheat. That means if you have this type of metering device and you charge the system correctly and the conditions hit with a 65 degree wet bulb and an outdoor temperature of 110 degree dry bulb, you would be outside design conditions. This metering device working correctly, charged correctly, would overfill the evaporator and it would flood the compressor with liquid refrigerant, killing that compressor over time. So some other numbers we look at. Let's say that we were at another temperature that's not Las Vegas. Let's say we had a return air wet bulb of 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature and humidity combined. And our outdoor temperature was 81 degrees. If our outdoor temperature was 81 and our return air wet bulb was 57, our target superheat would be at 5 and still be working correctly. That's our lowest possible number. But if we kept the indoor temperature and humidity the same and we rose the outdoor temperature, let's say to 86, now we're in that danger zone, outside design conditions. So that fixed orifice meter device sounds great. It sounds simple, but it's very easy to get outside these design conditions and we'll end up flooding our evaporator coil. Whether you use the formula or you use the chart, you still get your target superheat, meaning what we want our superheat to be. So this is one way of doing it. Formula is another way. Soon we're going to talk about the app, but we're going to wait till we talk about the app because there's many more instruments and technology that goes in with using the app to find this information for you. But this is what I want you to see. Your super eat could be as low as five and as high as 40 and still be working correctly. Depends on the conditions. So next I want to talk about this caution zone where it's in yellow. It says caution here. Notice how low our outdoor temperature is. Our outdoor temperature is very low. Ideally, if my outdoor temperature was 66 degrees, I would open a window and have some cooling, but people still run their units. So if we're in this condition right here, let's see what we're gonna look at. It says the indoor return air temperature dry bulb must be above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're running the air conditioner below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and you're in this area, your saturated temperature could be below 32. You could be freezing up your evaporator coil. So even though your superheat would be running correctly, you would be running below 32 degrees saturated and it's possible to freeze up the unit. When it says caution here, it says make sure your dry bulb of the air inside is above 70 degrees. That's so we don't freeze up that evaporator coil. Very important to make sure saturated temperature inside is always above 32. 32. 
I designed this chart for me and my AC company. When I got into teaching, I found that it was very beneficial for students to use this as well. So I'm gonna add that link to the video so you can get this chart and use it. But let's talk a little bit more about what this number means. This number is the target superheat. This is what we're aiming for. This means this is what it should be doing. So we'll do an example. Let's say my return air temperature wet bulb with a digital psychrometer or a thermometer with a wet wick, that temperature came to be 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I did my outdoor dry bulb temperature with a plain thermometer, digital or otherwise, that temperature came out to be, we'll say 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So I put IDWB for indoor wet bulb 65, OD outdoor dry bulb 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So where the two numbers cross on our chart, we come out to be a 15 degree target super heat. That's what we want. We want a 15 degree super heat under the evaporator under these conditions. These conditions change, that number is gonna to change too. Target super heat, what we're aiming for, what we're shooting for, what we want it to be, that's our target. But how do we know if we're actually there or not? Is that number, uh, are we meeting that number? So the next we have to do is use the formula we've already learned. So the formula we've already learned in the previous video was the formula for superheat is the actual suction line temperature minus the suction saturated temperature equals a superheated vapor. So we're gonna take our clamp thermometer. So if we apply those numbers to our formula, we're gonna get the actual suction line temperature. Remember, we're gonna clamp the thermometer on the actual suction line. So it's getting the true temperature of that suction line. So let's get that number, and let's say that number comes out to be 55. So we're gonna put in 55 degrees in our formula, actual suction line temperature. Then, we're gonna get our PSIG convert it to a saturated temperature. This is suction, suction saturated. It's gonna be on that suction, the bigger pipe. So we get our suction saturated. Let's say that number comes out to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So now 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So 50 minus 40 equals a superheated vapor of 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, looky there, what a great match. Our target superheat, what we want is 15 degrees superheated vapor. So this much is 15 degrees superheated vapor. I check it on a unit, actual suction line temperature minus suction saturated temperature equals 15 degrees. Fantastic. That means I have the correct amount of refrigerant in the evaporator coil. That's what we want. We want the correct amount of refrigerant in the evaporator coil. So our target superheat of 15 and our actual superheat, what we're doing is also at 15. So that's a good number. We know that we're matched. That's the goal, right? That's the idea. Now we also need to look at the outside. We're going to get that here shortly, but we know that, hey, boom, we know exactly what our superheat should be. And we know that we're matching that but nothing's perfect in the world. We're always gonna have situations. So let's talk about when that number does not match because that's something you're gonna actually see. So let's say that our target superheat was at 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what we want, same conditions. And we wanted a 15 degree superheat under those conditions. It's not a set number. Let's do our math again. Our actual suction line temperature. Let's say our actual suction line temperature. We get a thermometer, we clamp it in the line on the suction line and that number came to be say 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And I did my suction saturated temperature, which is suction PSIG converted to temperature. And that number came out to be, let's just throw a number out. Let's say it was 35, right? So now we do our math. Actual suction line temperature, 65, minus our suction saturated PSIG converted temperature, 35. So 65 minus 35, that's 30 degrees superheated vapor. So my superheat of the system is at 30. I have 30 degrees of superheated vapor. So I have this much superheated vapor, but I should have this much superheated vapor. I have too much superheated vapor. If I have too much superheated vapor, that means I don't have enough saturation. This would be what we call high superheat. In other words, my target was still 15. My actual superheat was 30. So 30 is higher than 15. This is called a high superheat. And anytime you say superheat, add the word vapor to it. So this is a high superheat or a high superheated vapor. My actual superheat is higher than my target. High superheat. Again, too much vapor. If I have too much vapor in a container, too much vapor means not enough liquid or not enough saturation. Sometimes that confuses people. So let's demonstrate this a slightly different way. So let's think of this cup 
being my evaporator coil. And I can't see the liquid, but I can only see the vapor. And I want this much superheated vapor. If I know I have that much superheated vapor, I know how much liquid's there. We can't measure the liquid because it's latent heat. We can't measure latent heat necessarily. So here's where I want to be with my superheated vapor. So let's say it's to this line. And let's add some refrigerant to this. Now we can see right now, I want this much superheated vapor. And if we look in the cup, I have that much superheated vapor. So the rest of this would be saturation. And I know I'm good. My saturation level matches where I want it to be. So I want that much superheated vapor. I have that much superheated vapor. But in this scenario, in this case right now, I want there to be this much superheated vapor. But I have too much. My superheated vapor is too high. I have too much superheated vapor. That means I do not have enough liquid or saturation in my cup or my evaporator coil. So if your superheat is too high, we call this a starved evaporator coil. So this evaporator coil would be starved. This is what we call high superheat. And we'll make this note, high superheat. High superheated vapor means that we have a starved evaporator coil. That means I do not have enough refrigerant in my evaporator coil. Now don't go and start charging refrigerant in there. We still got to look at the condenser. We got to look at airflow, but assuming your airflow is correct, we do not have enough refrigerant in our evaporator coil. Where did it go? We'll talk about that in a minute, but that's what high superheat means. My superheat was too high. I have too much vapor, not enough saturation. I'm saying that over and over again, because I find that students sometimes get a little confused with that. So I'm trying to lay down the groundwork, groundwork with that. Now let's look at another example. Let's say it's the same exact conditions. I want my superheat to be at 15 only because the conditions for that fixed orifice meet our map. Let's do our actual suction line temperature and our suction saturated again. Let's put it in our formula. I take my actual suction line temperature and my suction line temperature comes out to be, let's say 40 degrees Fahrenheit. My suction saturated PSIG converted to temperature that number comes out to be 30 degrees. That's say 35, 35 degrees. So actual suction line temperature of 40 minus our suction saturated PSIG converted temperature, 35 gives us a five degrees of superheated vapor, five degrees of superheated vapor. So now five degrees of superheated vapor, is that higher than 15 or lower than 15? Well, it's lower than 15. My superheat is considered low at this point. So we have a low superheated vapor, low superheated vapor. So let's look at that again. Here's my line. This is how much superheat I want. But in reality, what we have is only this much superheat. I want to have this much superheat. I only have this much superheat. That means that we have a flooded evaporator coil or there's too much refrigerant in our evaporator coil. So low superheated vapor equals a flooded evaporator. So it's important that you write down the complete words. Don't just put superheat, put high superheated vapor because now you're thinking about vapor. High superheated vapor equals a starved evaporator coil. Don't just say starved because it's not the whole system starved. We're looking at just the evaporator coil. So high superheated vapor means there's too much vapor not enough liquid, we're starved in evaporator coil. Low superheated vapor, there's too little vapor. If there's not enough vapor, that means there's too much liquid. We're flooded, we're overfilled our evaporator coil. So that's called a flooded evaporator coil. Low superheated vapor, flooded evaporator coil. So this ties in. So our superheat can be high, high superheated vapor, we're starved. It can be good, right where we want it to be, or our superheat can be too low. In other words, we're flooding our evaporator coil. Essentially, we need two numbers, our target, what it's what we want it to be, and our actual superheat with our little formula. That's how we find out what's happening in the evaporator. Still a lot more that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about other situations, but let's now look at our condensing coil.